Refugees are continuing to flee the fighting in Ukraine. To date, according to the UN, more than 10 million people have left their lives behind, many also leaving loved ones. They are making the journey to Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, Moldova, Belarus, and even to Russia. Here in the UK, more than 21,000 visas have been issued to Ukrainians who have immediate or extended family in Britain. And around 2,700 visas have been issued to British families, welcoming refugees into their homes. Although the government has been criticised for the Homes for Ukraine scheme, as more than 38,000 applications have been made to date. To tell us more about all of this is Dr. Michelle Ritchie, who recently took part in an event focused on supporting Ukrainian refugees. Uh, hello, Michelle. How are you? Hi, good. Thanks, Peter. Nice Excellent. to be with you today. Oh, good, good. It's good to have you. Um, if you would, wouldn't mind starting by telling us a bit about yourself and a bit about your background and what you do. Sure. So my name's Michelle Ritchie. I'm a lecturer in technology and entrepreneurship and I'm in the university I'm based in the School of Business and Economics and broadly speaking in the longer term my research interests focus on technology and business for social good uh, responding to social problems and social change so that's the kind of bigger background and I first became involved in um, research that involves uh, refugees um, back in 2015 during the so-called European refugee crisis, which seems like a long time ago in our memories now, um, I was personally involved as a volunteer and just began to see that there was a lot of need for more evidence-based approaches, uh, for the evidence base to just be strengthened in support of best practice and also um, policy initiatives and all sorts of things. So uh, I also began to see that probably each of us in our own positions has something unique to offer to any of these situations above and beyond just simply humanitarian kind of empathetic actions. So I started to look around from my position in the business school to see where can I make best use of my position and my skills and I, I started off with a social enterprise based in London called the Entrepreneurial Refugee Network um, who were using business and organising as a way of offering livelihood strategies to refugees who were being locked out of the, the, the kind of work and employment opportunities. Yeah, um, that was in fact, that, that's what that's one of my questions that I've got for you yeah. later. Actually. It's, okay. it's about what do refugees actually do? Like once you've been given a visa or status, how do you support your family from there? You know, you're in, you're in a completely new, different place. You're just probably might not speak the language you know where do you go but um yeah we'll, we'll cover that, that later yeah um, where, were you involved with any ukrainian refugees back in 2015 then because there was um there was there was a migration crisis then in 14 wasn't there 2014 2015 yeah it was slightly after that that i got directly personally involved but the honest truth is although we see these crises kind of in isolation they're really not in isolation at all and the global picture is Actually, uh, best estimates are that, you know, 1% of the world's population is now displaced. And this crisis comes off the back of most recently, um, you know, the, the uh, US withdrawal from Afghanistan, which is quite recent in our memories. Of course, the, the war in Syria and all sorts of ongoing protracted contracts, uh, conflicts, sorry, all over the world. So what we're seeing is both the immediate pressing needs um, associated with forced migration are intensifying. Uh, the speed and scope of this current crisis in Ukraine is unseen and unheard of since the Second World War. More refugees moving more quickly um, than any time since then. But it also, it comes off the back of all of those other crises. So the, the system that we have in place largely overseen by UNHCR is creaking at the seams quite frankly to cope with these these successive crises that just keep coming and coming and getting larger and larger and closer and closer to all nations really. So who are these refugees? Uh, we know that a lot of the men have stayed back to fight. Um, are we looking at just sort of mothers and their children, um, elderly people, um, people who are sick? Who, who are they? Yeah, the, we always have imperfect um, data from any kind of ongoing crisis situation. The best data we get is from the IOM, which is an arm of the UN, um, and who have been surveying um, kind of samples of this population on the move. 
uh, they estimate between 50 and 60 percent are women and any anyone that they surveyed that had wherever there was a head of household be that male or female uh, 50 percent of them had children with them um, there's also all sorts of complex needs of people because you're talking about a whole society on the move really so there's people um, uh, who are in vulnerable categories people with illnesses in need of medication people who were in the middle of undergoing treatments and um, the elderly uh, on the move as well so you're looking at a whole a whole society on the move with any of the complexity uh, that that would entail for our society were we on the move and it's useful to imagine it you know, in relation to ourselves and what that would look like for ourselves were, were the same uh, situation to be true here. Yeah, uh, so and most, as, as we've heard, most have gone over to Poland. So I think there's mm. just over 2 million people who've gone there. And then uh, the other countries are Romania, Moldova, and even um, Russia and Belarus. Uh, yes. Um, so talk, can you tell me first about what, what will they expect to find when they get over the border? What will be there to greet them? I mean, presumably they they aren't just handed visas straight away and, and told to go and settle down. What what happens? Yeah, well, there, there's there's various reasons that people might head in the direction of Russia and, and Belarus, and and those are all so diverse, really. Oftentimes, you find people making those decisions based on things like family connections, because you mm. move from insecurity to try and find security somewhere. So, you know. We, we've heard a lot about this in the news, haven't we? That there's such close connections between Russia and the Ukraine, family groups that, you know, that transcend the, that kind of national boundary. So people, I, I would <laughs> guess, are moving because the language there will be easy for them to pick up. Many people will be Russian speakers, um, will have Russian family there. Um, I, I'm not sure I'm well placed to say what greets them there, no. but, they, but, but they probably face kind of similar issues with resettlement as you would in, in many countries. Yeah. Uh, and that is that, you know, the, the struggle to do many things at once, to find housing, to find a source of livelihood, to get your visa sorted out. And the hope in any of those situations is that this is temporary. Most people you hear, as, as with any refugees, say that they want to return home. Mm. Uh, the prospects for that don't look very hopeful at the minute and and we see that a lot again in the in the refugee system is that the it's there to cope with emergency needs and temporary accommodation of these needs but actually uh, what we're not talking about at the moment in this crisis situation is that the average the average length of time for someone uh, to be seeking asylum and in a refugee situation at the moment it's actually 17 years that's the a global wow. average so it's not a temporary state no, it's no hey. longer we, we've got to start reframing how we think about this and thinking not only about these kind of immediate term uh, you know, three-year visas, but how do we build capacity out to deal with much longer-term displacement? Yeah, well, I mean, I, um, you probably guess from my surname that I'm Polish, and yeah. there's only there's only one way I, I well, I suppose there's a number of ways I got here, but um, it was my grandparents who were all refugees, mm. and they sort of, uh, they came here after the Second World War, um, and they, they integrated fairly, fairly well. So, I mean, is there... Is there lessons that we can learn from from what happened after the Second World War? Yeah, massively, and I think we, it's useful to look back and see that. You know, we we always we always look back on very um, things that we're very proud of in the Second World War, like. Uh, I've heard a lot of people making reference to the kinder transport. We've got, we can't forget that there's still a very checkered history with that. You know, we allowed all these children to arrive, but we didn't allow their parents to come with us, uh, with them, sorry. So we've still got to remember, you know, we've got to, we've got to take a hard look at ourselves and our policies, I think, and how kind of open and inclusive some of these pol policies have historically been. And I think one thing that we can learn from recent history is uh, what the U UN Secretary General has has. Um, said at the moment is that he feels that the the compassionate kind of outpouring of empathy that we've seen this time is is one of the silver linings of what's happening at the minute and that um even countries that were lurching towards much more draconian kind of refugee systems like the uk and the netherlands uh, as well yeah. have had to backtrack and think in, initially were kind of harder line requirements for visas um but 
it, it, you know, in the context of a great outpouring of public support and empathy, um, you know, uh, they've been encouraged and pushed towards um, having slightly more uh, open policies and open, uh, you know, well, we'll get onto those in a minute, I'm Poland sure. Poland itself as well was very anti, Poland itself was very anti, um, immigration yes. as well before this yeah uh, yeah this, for some reason there's just this complete u-turn and they've 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 obviously they've welcomed so many people yeah and i think in part part of it is this kind of thing of, uh, th these are our close european neighbors and i think one of the things that this crisis has done is create a couple of really seismic shifts in what we think about refugees like there's a really oft quoted number from the uh, UN figure that 85% of the world's refugees are in low and middle income countries. That is actually, in light of this crisis, no longer the case. In fact, Europe now hosts more refugees than any other region of the world in light of this crisis. Oh. So it's created this huge shift. It, it, it's that close neighboring, it's that close neighboring country, but we can't, again, we can't fool ourselves because our initial responses say to the Syrian refugee crisis, were very empathetic. Backlash always, always lurks around the corner, you know, because the, our, our initial kind of compassion, the initial compassion shown, the initial empathy. I mean, in Poland, you're right, there's been a huge outpouring of support and empathy, but already, you know, strollers being left at the train stations and, you know, people arriving to pick people up, just, just fine and pick people up. There's been a great pride in that kind of response in Poland. And I've as well got close Polish friends and neighbours who've had, felt very proud of the response, but who've yeah. also said there's a limit to how much we can do this on a humanitarian basis because how do we pay for all of this and <laughs> where do we actually put people and and so and this is part of the message and um the work that's being done with the network that I'm part of actually is that it is the right time at the moment to be talking about immediate responses and organizing in a crisis and how do we harness this kind of public empathy to move things in a in, in a more in a, in a more open and inclusive direction for all refugees and not just not only our most yeah. recent arrivals, um, but all of these things have to also um, you have to think about the long the longer term system and at the moment it's a humanitarian system. Um, we try and offshore our borders and keep a lot the large majority of this growing number of refugees in camps, even in detention centers, um, and a huge, a tremendous cost, that comes at a tremendous cost. Um, and a lot of the discussion now is about how do you make that system, which is only growing, and it is only gonna come under more pressure. I mean, th this, this past few years has shown us it's not, refugee displacement, it's not an isolated incident, is it? These no, are no. successive crises. And actually, one thing at the moment, you know, in a, in a crisis situation, there's going to be a time to think about this further down the line. This is all bound up in the uh, climate environment, uh, the, the impending environmental crisis as well, because a lot of people are not only displaced by politics uh, and war and, and threat of violence. So the, the UN um, definition of a refugee is someone fleeing um, because of a well-founded fear of persecution. That doesn't really adequately cover at the moment people who are displaced by environmental catastrophes, yeah, yeah, yeah. who are also seeking asylum, who are also seeking safety. And actually the World Bank have predicted that by 2050, we're looking at somewhere around 143 million refugees globally. You know, so there's this is a growing crisis. And one of the things that the network that I work in that looks at, how, how can we orient this system to not only cope with a crisis in the short term, but to, as successive waves come in, how can we make this a sustainable system that has the capacity to cope with these growing numbers yeah. and um, can do that at scale sustainably? Yeah. Um, business likes to think it's really well oriented towards those kinds of solutions <laughs> and innovation and technology all play a role in that. Mm -hmm. But that, that's the push that's coming from our own school, from, from this, this network of investors and businesses that I work in, yeah. um, and also from places like the Refugee Studies Centre at Oxford, um, who are saying, you know, for this to be 
sustainable for this to operate at scale, we've got to start thinking about not, not so much a humanitarian system that that is that is there for crisis situations like this, but in the longer term, we've got to couple that with an opportunity oriented system that gives, for example, asylum seekers the opportunity to work, which is good for them, which takes that cost burden off their receiving countries a little bit. Yeah. Also, you know, we, we can we can see from a personal point of view. How does that work then? How do so what barriers are there between a, a an asylum seeker or refugee coming to this country or any mm. country and getting a job and and how will what you're sort of how what you're looking at help that how will it break that yeah. break those barriers down that's a great question so at the moment um there are tremendous barriers all over the place um to refugees and asylum seekers so just to make the distinction an asylum seeker is someone who who arrives spontaneously in a country seeking safety and when they're granted that right to remain, they become a refugee. So you, you are granted refugee status. So it's important yeah. to make that distinction because you have different rights in both of those circumstances. So, for example, currently in the UK, um, asylum seekers are not granted the right to work. In fact, most recently, that's that's been uh, debated in the House of Lords and the House of Lords have um, have supported a move that after six months of, you know, uh, asylum, sh asylum seekers should be given the right uh, to work whilst their proclaim is being processed. But at the moment that's facing stiff opposition in the House of Commons. What's, the, what's the opposition? What's the reason? So in the House of Commons, there's a number of uh, dynamics going on. But one of the things that I observe is that quite often uh, they, they conflate uh, different kinds of migration and, and different issues with asylum. So, for, for example, uh, of the the stickiness we're seeing in this in this system at the moment is because they are worried about the security risks posed by people coming into the country, and that's a really common that's a really common objection raised in the House of Commons. Yeah, uh, particularly for all by sorts of things. Though, for <laughs> yeah, for all, so security yeah. concerns. It's part of the rising kind of nationalist sentiment, I yeah. think, yeah. and and it, and in in line with that, they conflate all sorts of issues, um, migration issues. Uh, people that we might refer to as economic migrants who don't flee their own countries because of safety or concerns, um, but become just seeking opportunities for better livelihoods or better chances for their kids. Those people are not covered by the, the refugee uh, kind of international refugee conventions or, 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 or ethical kind of moral obligations, yeah. um, but they're often those two groups are conflated. And so there's a lot of debate in, and, and really I think what it comes down to is that it's seen as an electable issue, that if you can control yeah. migration, um, you know, migra migration is, is, is uh, seen as being to blame for other issues that are going on in our economy, places that haven't had, you know, um, job security for a long time, uh, you know, areas up north where there's kind of deindustrialization, yeah. and and they conflate all of these issues. I mean, we saw back in 2015 uh, the Brexit campaign really conflating these issues, didn't mm. we? You know, this these photographs that we saw of this inward flux of people who were supposed yeah. to be stealing jobs and threatening British kind of prospects all of these things are conflated and what we really need to do is real just untangle them because actually uh 70 percent of people who apply for asylum are granted asylum you know quite rapidly which means that there are grounds for them to seek safety uh, you know and, and resettlement so we we do have to be seen as a legitimate international state we we have to fulfill these moral obligations to people we have to allow them to seek safety um as a human right so untangling some of those issues for for our politicians in the house of commons is, is really really important they can't continue to kind of scapegoat refugees who seem to be at the sharp end um of, of a lot of uh, you know, their, <laughs> their, the blame game. <laughs> yeah. Do you think this will change that slightly now? Because it's a lot harder to um, to sort of roll out some of these tropes when 
we went these people are, are we, a lot of um, British people see these as our European neighbors yeah and they they are a lot more welcoming and do you think that some of these sort of these um these populist ideas won't mm. won't hold with with what's going on at the minute yeah, I, th I think for, th for the moment, it seems like a hopeful opportunity. Yeah. Because it is, I mean, uh, in the UK, we can see that it's in light of that huge outpouring, what, but somewhere between 100,000 and 150,000 people now have signed yeah. up to host a refugee in their home. And it's that huge public kind of outpouring of support that pushed the government who were initially only going to allow Ukrainians with family members in the UK. Yeah. So you can see that, you know, public sentiment can really soften some of these policies. And, you know, as, as always, if our politicians see this as an election issue, that's when they prioritise it. So Absolutely. there is a hopeful <laughs> moment. There is a hopeful moment. And, you know, we can see that, uh, you know, in, in the past as well. Um, uh, other conflicts in which there were uh, uh, outpourings of support and then changes uh, in some of the, the international European policies. Um, the, I think it's called the Dublin Agreement. <laughs> this is stretching my memory now, you might want to edit <laughs> this bit, but, but your, European policy is also shaped by some of these dynamics really and, and, mm. and public sentiment re really does uh, have a moment. But again, I think one of the things that makes that public support sustainable is that uh, and then we see this in other areas of the world, actually. So there's in, some interesting case in points in areas of the world that we're doing some research in, in uh, particularly in Africa, that bears quite a heavy burden of, of, of displacement kind of internationally. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not only Europe where there's kind of, you know, un unequal treatment of refugees from different countries and different responses to one group and then and another that happens, you know, all over the world. Um, but where what seems to work the model that seems to work is that where um crisis and humanitarian responses um serve an immediate and pressing need they can be coupled with in inward development in things like infrastructure where local people share in the benefits of you know receiving and hosting new groups yeah um and, and that's worked, that's worked very well in, in, in Africa. And it's what Poland are crying out for at the moment, actually, and saying, you know, right, I can open up my hotel for so long, but I need, I, I, you know, I, I need this to be sustainable. So inward, inward development uh, that, that uh, you know, especially regions that um, traditionally would, you know, would, uh, would struggle, um, they, those tend to be the areas that host a lot of refugees. Yeah. Um, so in, inward investment, things like schools and roads and simple things like that. And then an opportunity oriented approach. So job creation, financial investment from, from big corporations. Um, we've seen again, like kind of a, a grassroots uh, swell of support, you know, support in principle for these kinds of um, ideas. Um, there's a, a coalition of businesses, I'm, I'm sure you probably saw Peter in the news, who were saying, right, we, we need workers, there's going to be yeah, an yeah. influx of people, we're going to sign up to, to make sure that there's jobs available for some of these incoming people, and, yeah. and a, a huge group of, of British businesses um, uh, have, have made that kind of public commitment. Um, there's a, a commitment in principle, I think, to the idea that you know, it, it makes a lot more sense for people to be able to work, to be able to support themselves and to be able to kind of do things more sustainably. It's been depressing really to see um, some of the people in my own research, as I've spoken to people who have been resettled, you know, in different, in different waves um, for different reasons from different regions of the world, but some of them have been, their asylum claim has taken some, you know, between six, to 11 years or, or more to process and in that time their right to work has been suspended and whether they would prefer it or not they're constrained to live off social security yeah. you know social housing that's not only a tremendous cost to the government but it's also a huge waste of their human talent because yeah. part of their recovery and their re-emergence from this awful experience is 
I can get on with work. I can start to move forward. You know, I can have something to hope for in the future. I can contribute to my local community. And most people you speak to, in fact, there's none that I've spoken to that haven't wanted to do that. Um, and is and it just bureaucracy then that's 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 sort of clogging up the system? Why why does it take so long? Some of the cases are complex. Yeah. Um, I think we're seeing this in the in the current situation actually. So there's a, a lot of uh, burden of proof placed on the person seeking asylum yeah. uh, to you know to prove the reasons that they fled, uh, to prove their status in their home country. You know when you flee, you often don't have time to bring a lot of bank statements yeah. with you or paperwork. Uh, and again, that's a criticism that's currently being levelled at the government's. Um, Kind of approach to to the uh, housing for refugees initiative is yeah. that the, the the paperwork that's required the ukrainians simply don't have you know many of them are on computers in bomb shelters <laughs> uh, with <laughs> intermittent access to the internet yeah. and filling in long forms on a very glitchy website and i mean that it, it's just an extreme example of what this process can be like you know the forms are can be fairly opaque or require you to have have documents that you simply don't have when you've yeah. fled. Well, you mentioned the number of the number of applications from British people opening their homes, and mm. and they've they've granted just under three thousand visas. So from yes. from one hundred and fifty thousand people showing interest, three thousand yeah. two thousand seven hundred have actually been yes. granted, which is just it's received a lot of criticism for that. It's been very frustrating for people, hasn't yeah. it? Very frustrating because you you feel you open your home feeling the urgency of the situation for people and you know yeah. how urgent it is um and i can only imagine that people have gone through their lives to just assess can i do this and to respond <laughs> quickly and to be faced with all these bureaucratic delays is yeah. is a headache to say the least yeah absolutely okay. i think uh that giving direction um and uh working with this kind of groundswell of empathy it's, it's a really important moment for the government uh, to, to get this right but what people have shown is where at time and time again where the government or, or local uh, administration can't move quick enough they'll simply try and organize around it and there's some great great examples of that from you know uh, conflicts and um, and influxes of, of migrants in the recent past um, and you know these these exact there's hubs of activity where you see these things taking place and oftentimes in mainland europe uh, train stations are the place where these things happen because these are the arrival points for people yeah. you know people coming by car or uh, towards a checkpoint or coming on train to a train station and we've seen we've seen the strollers be there as quite a quite a moving um display of, of solidarity recognizing that there's a lot of women and children on the move um uh, in those there's, there's a great well documented example of uh, grassroots organizing at a train station in vienna uh, during the 2015-16 um uh, influx of people as well where uh, self-organized at, at the at the local train station in vienna people are, had got a really smooth operation and it was manned purely by volunteers and in the end the local the local kind of government had to just kind of give way and defer to this group of volunteers on what was going on on the ground where could people get the things they needed where could they go for housing because it just wasn't moving quick enough yeah otherwise. that sounds lovely yeah okay well that's brilliant i think i think we'll leave it there michelle that's that's been really really nice to hear you talk thank you very much thanks so much Peter. thank you Good very to much you. you too bye okay. bye thank you for listening or watching if you're on youtube this show is available on apple podcasts spotify and all other platforms i hope you join us again